This is the Hockey News Podcast. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Hockey News Fantasy Podcast. It's Matt Larkin here with producer Stephen Ellis. Within my line of sight, he's lurking around. We are powered by BetMGM. And we're ready to talk some fantasy. It's been a little while. I'm going to start, as always, with the update on my league. I always want to just let you know how I'm doing. I feel like it's just, I want to keep it honest between us, okay? So far, so good. I'm a couple points out of first overall. I'm slipping a little bit. I'm chasing fellow Hockey News staffer Brian Costello. I do have Alexander Barkov, who is hurt. And Tony D'Angelo has COVID or he's in COVID protocol. So I'm, I'm slipping a little bit. We're reaching the dog days of the season. But I'm hanging in okay. To start... This episode, we're going to give you some shallow league advice. The shallow league pickup of the week is Joel Erickson Eck. He's available in 48% of Yahoo leagues at the moment. And to me, again, it, it depends on the size of your league, but I don't see any reason why in most leagues Erickson Eck shouldn't be owned. We know he's centering the top power play unit in Minnesota. He's centering the second line at the moment. If we add up, we have almost a full season's worth of sample size if you, if you combine this season and last season. So over the past 78 games in two seasons, 28 goals, 178 shots, 138 hits. If your league counts plus minus, he's plus 20. He's even blocked 55 shots. So you get a really nice combo meal from Joel Erickson Eck. And this year, the power play points are coming as well. He didn't get any power play points last year. So he contributes to many different categories, and that's why he should be owned, I think, in shallow leagues next up we have a very boring pickup but sometimes you just have to make that pickup if it's going to help your team the medium league pickup of the week ryan johansson who is available in 76 percent of leagues and it's weird you know he's he's not the most exciting but when the role is there it's there he's centering the top power play unit. it's very similar to joel erickson neck and that johansson centering the second line and the top power play unit he's got 18 points in 22 games he seems to have turned back the clock a little bit he's getting a lot of power play points so if you're in a league that sort of awards equal weight to several different categories and it's not a goals heavy league you can get ryan johansson as a nice source of assists and power play points and points in general in particular now we have the deep league pickup. Michael Bunting is available in 82% of leagues. And it's interesting, you know, when we look at, at sort of valuing guys based on their line deployments, one thing I always preach is don't do it in the draft. Don't reach on a guy based on the rumor that he's going to be playing with Connor McDavid or Austin Matthews because if he's not and you end up using a high pick, you've really messed yourself up there. It's very different when it comes to in-season pickups because that pickup's free. You're not passing on another good player, and it's a great time to chase line deployments, and that's what you're doing if you're picking up Michael Bunting. We know now he's playing on that first line, the left wing spot, the vacated spot that was Zach Hyman's. He's with Austin Matthews and Mitch Marner, and he's got six points in his past four games. His ice time is on the rise. And we know that the Leafs, they want someone to stick in that role. Maybe Bunting can be, he has the feistiness in his game. He could end up being the long-term replacement for Zach Hyman on that line. We know the Leafs tried Nick Ritchie there as well. But so far, it's been much much more successful with Bunting. So that's someone who's, again, available in 82% of leagues. Could be a very valuable pickup and could be sustainable if he stays on that line right for all season. It's entirely possible he does. Okay, the next category we have is the WTF pickup. And that's still a relatively new category. It's WTF in the sense of why is this person available in any leagues? It's Devon Taves of the Colorado Avalanche, available in 22% of leagues. He's averaging better than a point per game, 10 in his past nine. If you add up his two seasons so far, that combined to just 63 games with the Colorado Avalanche, it's 12 goals and 41 points, which is great production for a defenseman. He plays massive minutes in Colorado with so much talent around him. And with you know, he's always playing 23, 24 minutes a night, so he gets so many opportunities to accumulate volume. And some people might think, well, Kale McCarr is the player to own in fantasy from the Avalanche, but they don't cancel each other out. They're literally a pair. They play together. So it's not like they're competing for each other for certain looks or points. Really, they feed off each other. So Devon Taves, he's much less expensive, of course, in drafts than Kale McCarr, but it's crazy that he's available. I guess because he was hurt to start the year. That's probably why he was available. Uh, okay, now... Let's move on to our tip of the week. And this is a time of the season, if you look at the schedule, most teams in the league, are, give or take, where you know, we're passing the 20-game mark and we're roughly a quarter of the way through the season. And that creates kind of an interesting juncture in which the sample sizes are still relatively small, but they're not so tiny. And 
to me, that creates interesting opportunities for sell highs and buy lows because the sell highs, whoever you're selling the player to, he's played enough games that maybe the person acquiring him believes it's legit. And the buy low, the struggling player, has been bad long enough that maybe the frustrated GM believes they're not going to turn it around. But 20 games is not that big of a sample size. We can look for anomalies and exploit them. So if I give you a couple examples, the, the best place to look, the first place to look when you're trying to make that buy low, look at shooting percentage. The same with sell high. If there's someone with an unsustainably high shooting percentage, you want to trade that player. If there's someone with an unsustainably low shooting percentage, it's a great buy. So right now, some examples I've written down here, Jared McCann, Troy Terry. They're both off to great, start, great starts. Both of them are shooting the puck at such a high percentage that it's just not sustainable. It doesn't matter if they've made leaps forward in their games. The shooting percentage is so much higher than the career average that it will come down almost almost definitely. So they're excellent sell highs. On the flip side, you have Cole Caulfield, you have Mark Shifley. Those are players with crazy low shooting percentages right now. And it would take, I don't know if they'd have to break a million mirrors to stay that unlucky for the rest of the season. So they are ideal targets. They have really bad numbers, both of them right now. Mark Shifley has got two goals. That's crazy to me. And that's why I'd be all, it's funny. I actually made an offer from Mark Shifley before the podcast, when I was doing some research for this, I was like, oh my God. Mark Shifley, he's got two goals. That's not going to stay the way it is because the shooting percentage is so low. Great buy low, so I, I made the play. Okay, so that is my piece of advice of the week. Steven, I think we're ready for questions now. I'm ready if you are. Let's get them going. All right, the first question comes from Brett Elliott. I have both Thomas Hurdle and Sam Reinhardt on my roster. Is it time to cut ties with both? Okay, well, I always sound like I'm copying it when I say this, but I really do mean it. The answer to a question like that, it always has to be relative. So in the future, if anyone's sending me that kind of question, it always helps to tell me the size of your league, how many teams are in the league, how many players per team. Because if this is a crazy shallow league, you know, Steven last year played in a four-team league, then sure, go ahead, cut Thomas Hurdle and Sam Reinhardt. But if this is a standard... I want it, by the way. What's that? You, I won, yeah, so that's won all that matters. four teams, congratulations. Hey, but I was last for the first half of the okay, season. Fair enough, fair enough. Uh, but if it's a league that's even close to a standard size, whether it's a 12-team league, 16-team league, I think those are two players that are almost always going to be rosterable. Um, especially if you look deeper, too. Reinhardt, he already has two goals in his past three games. And we know the statistical profile of Sam Reinhardt. He's one of the most streaky players of his generation. That's sort of his calling card. He always goes on these sizzling runs. It's usually, I think, in the second half. Last season, he had a little patch where he had no goals and one point in an eight-game stretch. The rest of the season, he had 14 goals, 20 points in 24 games. So when Reinhardt gets hot, he can be a real frontline fantasy performer. That's someone you're going to want on your team. And we haven't gotten the gangbusters run from Reinhardt yet. It seems like maybe it's starting now, right? So I think that's someone you actually want to target. Uh, so I would not be dropping him. Uh, Thomas Hurdle, he's still on pace for 30 goals, which is nothing to sneeze at. Uh, the assist count might be low in San Jose because that team is just not bursting with talent all around him. But that's still a perfectly usable amount of goals or pace in most formats so I wouldn't be dropping him either especially because if the Sharks eventually start to slide down in the standings Hurdle being a pending UFA could end up being traded to a contender and finding himself in a better fantasy situation down the stretch next question comes from six god Luke in a keeper do you like Seth Jarvis or Troy Terry more six god I wonder if that means he's a, a Toronto boy uh, that probably would be yeah. it. or okay. just a major Drake fan yeah okay he might be right around the corner from our studio. Who knows? It might have just been you. It's true. Uh, so if we look at the, pro the production relative to age, obviously Troy Terry has been one of the stories of the fantasy season, and I'm sure if you have him on your team, your team is probably doing very well. He's been a stunning surprise, which is weird because when he was coming up as a prospect, you know, scoring the winning goal at the World Juniors, he was expected to be an exciting NHL player, but it just took him a while. He's breaking out in his age 24 season. If you look at Seth Jarvis at only 19, he's already on pace to do better than anything Troy Terry did before this season, leading up to age 23. So if we're looking at the impact already and Seth Jarvis showing how NHL ready he appears to be this young I think that the trajectory for him is higher than Troy Terry's especially because as I, as I said earlier in this episode the shooting percentage is high for Troy Terry he could end up coming back down to earth and Jarvis you know he has all the he checks all the boxes right first round pedigree he scored at every level he lit it up in major junior last year because of the COVID rules when the, when the WHL season hadn't started yet he was allowed an exemption to go play in the AHL and he was leading the AHL in scoring when eventually he had to be returned to junior. He was like, uh, come on, I'm, I don't need to go back. Look what I'm doing here, but he had to go. 
But to me, it just shows, you know, when a player scores at every level and he has that first round pedigree, that's what you want to look for in terms of sustainable future production. And he's doing a lot more at 19 than Troy Terry was. So if you're projecting Troy Terry's 24 now, I think Seth Jarvis at 24 is going to be better than what Troy Terry is right now. So I think Jarvis would be the keeper for me. All right. Next question comes from Stolen Tomato Sauce, the best name. A couple of questions there. When Eichel returns, do you foresee him being a game changer to the Golden Knights? I'm wondering if I should hold on or sell high. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, if it's a keeper league you're talking about, then of course you're still you want to hold Jack Eichel, especially because his value is at an all-time low. Right? People are worried about the injury. He hasn't been on the ice producing since last season, and even last season wasn't going very well in Buffalo when he was playing through that injury. So now would be a terrible time to trade him at his bottom value in a keeper league. In a redraft format though, I would do the exact opposite. I would be trying to trade him right now because we look at the recovery timeline. So he had the surgery, the spinal or the disc replacement surgery, at best, three month recovery if everything goes perfectly, he returns in February. And that's best case, it's a procedure that no NHL player has ever done. So we really don't know what to expect. He's coming back to play a contact sport. If everything is perfect, he's back in three months, but it's possible it takes longer. It's possible he ends up not being ready in time for this season and then you'd be stuck with him and getting nothing out of him so if i were you i would be trying to trade jack eichel and get something for him now that can help you in the standings and you in a way you would be weakening that opponent because you're giving them back a player in a redraft league who won't be playing for at least a few more months right so that's the way i'd summarize it i would say keeper league i would Hold him absolutely. Redraft league. I would see what you can get for him in case someone's willing to pay top dollar. I will say so far, it is optimistic. I did speak recently with Jack Eichel's agent, Pat Brisson, and so far so good. He's comfortable in the recovery. Everything's off to a really good start. But we just don't know how things are going to go once he starts really ramping up his physical activity. All right. The next question comes from Rick. What are your thoughts on... DFS, and it's something that we kind of were talking a little bit about when we were about to record our uh, the main podcast yesterday. Yeah, DFS, it, it's tricky, right? So it is very popular. It's exciting if you want something to enjoy on a given night and you want higher stakes and something to, to be excited about, to be cheering on your TV and try and win some money in one big night. But parity works against you, I find, in DFS because on any given night in the NHL, especially compared to a league like, let's say, the NBA, the worst team in the league can beat the best team in the league. So you could be putting money down and setting a lineup that includes elite players and they might give you donuts, right? So it's still, I find very difficult to predict night to night. In my opinion, and I'm not saying that to dump on all hockey betting. Um, so don't worry about MGM, I, you know, if you're, if you're listening. Uh, I'm just saying that if I'm betting on hockey, I prefer to bet a different way. And that's to use prop bets and exotics because I think there's much better chances for parity to actually work in your favor in that case. So if you look at, for example, Stanley Cup odds, because of the fact that there is parity and any given team can surprise any season, there's always a chance you could make a low down bet on a Stanley Cup winner at the start of a season and that team ends up surprising going all the way. As an example, the Calgary Flames going into the season, I was looking at their preseason odds, plus 4,800 to win the Stanley Cup. That put them in the bottom third of the league. If you placed a $100 bet on Calgary, the start of the season you'd be in line to have a shot at winning 4800 bucks because the flames look like a legitimate contender right now with their tremendous goaltending playing great defensive hockey under Daryl Sutter so that's an example to me it's like use use the characteristics of the NHL landscape to your advantage don't let it work against you so in DFS I think parity in my opinion works against you whereas with long-term bets I think it actually can work in your favor all right the next question abs ducks sharks one guess they can't decide which team to cheer for considering two of them are sworn enemies of it's team Usulani. it has to be it's someone <laughs> just listed all his teams <laughs> that's very true uh is kadri for real enough to hold on for him long term or should i sell him while he's playing unreal yeah it's been an unbelievable season for for nazim kadri um i think the talent for him has never been a problem, right? He has that first round pedigree, he has tremendous hands, and, and he's shown repeatedly in his career the ability to produce in spurts when handed a, a larger assignment, right? So he, he is a very talented player. That said, we know obviously this huge surge in production is directly tied to 
the fact that Nathan McKinnon has been injured. Kadri has gotten the chance to play with Gabriel Landeskog and Miko Rantanen. So, of course, his numbers have exploded. If I was playing with Gabriel Landeskog and Miko Rantanen, my numbers would explode. That would mean like I would, I would have two assists. But again, that would be very exciting for me. Um, so I do think you have to look at the fact Nathan McKinnon, at the time that we're recording this podcast, uh, it, it's Tuesday, or it's Wednesday, rather, Wednesday, December 1st, and Nathan McKinnon is slated to return to the lineup against the Toronto Maple Leafs. It's highly likely he reclaims his spot on the top line. Maybe you could argue, okay, Kadri, it's a contract year, so he's playing out of his mind, and you could argue maybe that he's shown so much that it's given Jared Bednar something to think about, maybe splitting up, you know, two and two. So McKinnon and Landeskog and Kadri and Rantanen, or McKinnon and Rantanen and Kadri and Landeskog. It's possible Kadri has opened some eyes, but no matter what, he was on pace to get his 100th point by his 60th game or something, right? So there's no way he can sustain that, especially when McKinnon is coming back. So to me, he's an ideal sell high if you can find someone who just sees that stat line and pounces. And as a Kadri owner in my league, I will be trying to sell high. Hopefully my league mates are not listening to this episode. All right. Hazel Lee asks, I sometimes feel myself just forgetting to check my team on a daily basis. How can I spice things up to make the daily grind of fantasy hockey better? And that, that's a tough one. Because it really depends also who you're playing with, too. Yeah, I really like that question. Um, so to me, it's a matter of finding ways to achieve engagement. So the easiest place to start, if you're playing a Roto League, and that's just a league where it's whoever gets the most points, whatever wins, and there's no direct competition, that's the ultimate snooze fest, in my opinion. And in that case, I would just be looking for a head-to-head league. Because if you're playing head-to-head, you have a new opponent every week, the match lasts one week long. You're competing in various categories. You can jockey for position, picking up players to try and target categories. It's more of a chess match. There are bragging rights on the line, so I think it's more of a motivator to check your team. gets you much more engaged, so that would be the next step. If you're already doing that, if you're already in a head-to-head format and it's not enough, I think the next thing you want to try and do is maybe play with people you know. And that's something I've done for a long time. It kind of started when I was going away to university, so the early 2000s. It would have been the last year, my last year of high school, 2001, is when I started the league. You're old. Yeah, getting, getting up there. The league that I'm currently in. And it eventually became a way for my dad and I. My dad was the commissioner of our league, still is. It became a way for us to stay in touch. So you're having a league with people you know, loved ones, family, friends. And now we've taken it to another level. We've added a chat group. It's a WhatsApp chat. So we're all talking to each other every day. And it gets hockey on the mind, but you're also just keeping in touch with your friends, which is fun. You're not, you're not always talking about hockey, but just being in that chat, getting a message from a friend, a parent, a brother, whatever it is, a sibling, it sort of keeps it fresh in your mind. Something might remind you, someone might be bragging about something that happened about a player of theirs, and that'll remind you to check your team because you feel the competitive fire. So that's another approach that I would consider. If you can find the right group of people that you know, I think that makes you much more engaged. You might be texting with your opponent that week. Oh, I can't believe, oh, you had Philip Forsberg, you got four goals on me, damn, something like that, right? Uh, And if that's not a possibility for you, then to go back to your previous question, I think DFS might be a good way for you to play. So Hazel, if, so basically, if you're already playing head to head and you don't have a situation in which you can play with people you know, then I would try DFS because that's sort of a one-off and you're setting a new lineup for a given night of games and you can be very invested that day because you're setting the lineup that day. It doesn't matter if you forget the next day. You might be in a one-night tournament, right? So that would be another way to play to keep you much more engaged. All right. The next question comes from Eamon Devlin. Any tips on handling injuries? In both leagues I'm in, I have a slew of injuries beyond what I could put on IR. One league I'm still doing well, so tempted to hold out, but the other I'm sliding from a lack of games. Yeah, I think uh, Eamon, to me, you've answered your own question, right? I think you're already implying that you're going to have the right strategy. I think if it's really just a matter of assessing what your team can afford to lose in terms of man games. Um, If you are way behind in the standings trying to catch up, you have to be a little more heartless and drop players or maybe you can also trade players and that's a way to sort of help yourself in multiple ways if you have injured players but you could look and you're low in the standings you could look to a team that's really high and dangle a decent player who's injured and that team can afford to take them by taking them that team is also weakening itself temporarily and then you're freed maybe you're getting an asset a healthy asset coming back so you have to be much more ruthless i think if you're low in the standings if you're high then it's the opposite of course you can hang in there and if you can afford to take a loss i think there's no reason to hurry and i think you can just sort of sit there so i would say it sounds like you're playing multiple leagues and the league where you're in good shape, it's okay. Just weather the storm. The league where you're in bad shape, I think you have to be much more active trying to uh, remedy things in that league. 
All right, next question comes from someone who has never asked a question before, Ranton and Raven. How many keepers is too many? Assume no contracts in this league. One league I'm in has roster size of 22 with 13 keepers, and the standings rarely shift. That does seem like a lot. Yeah, that's no fun. And I'm, I've said before on this show, I'm always a, I'm always against formats that sort of deter managers from activity. And that's why I, I say never do lifetime contracts if you're doing contracts. And having so many keepers, I think it just really limits the size of the player pool, like the waiver wire. You can't make as many moves. You can't control your own destiny. It forces you to only improve your team via trades. And that's great if everybody, everybody in the league is really active. But I'd say even in a super active league, not everybody is a big time trader, right? So you want to at least have the wire as an option, an alternative option if you can't get something done. So yes, 13 keepers is way too much. To me, I think even five keepers is pushing it um, because it still will shrink the player pool a lot. If you have a 16 team and five keepers, that's 80 players off the board right away. Um, Again, I always use my own league as an example, but again, we've We've been working on this thing for 20 years, so that's why I think it has a lot of uh, good characteristics that can be shared. Uh, we use a graduated system of keepers, okay? So if you finish in the final, it's a head-to-head league. If you, if you make the final, so the two teams that make the final, they're only allowed to have two keepers. If you make the playoffs, you can have three keepers. If you miss the playoffs, you get four keepers. And to me, it really helps replenish the player pool because by virtue of making the final clearly you had a good team clearly you had a lot of good players you can only keep two now so that means some very good players are going back into the pool can be drafted the following year by the teams that maybe had bad years they kept more players they might have traded for first round picks so it gives the bad teams a chance to make a comeback and rebuild and have a shot the next year it makes it harder to stay on top for sure but we think it's a fun way to do it we also limit the number of goalies you can keep so one goalie per team to avoid sort of a goalie hoarding situation, which I think applies if your league awards a lot of weight and points to goaltending. All right. Next question comes from Andrew Freeman. Is it finally time to drop Shifley and Brock Besser? No way. No way, Andrew. Uh, I already (laughs) mentioned Mark Shifley uh, as one of my buy lows. So, of course, you can probably guess that that was going to be my answer. Um, But to me, Shifley is typically, give or take, top 20 asset in fantasy. So... He, and he's, he's got two goals, I know, but he's extremely unlucky. That's obviously going to change. And to bring it full circle, we've talked about Nazem Kadri as well in this podcast. I have Nazem Kadri, who's got 27 points right before the show. What, the player that I offered for Mark Shifley was Nazem Kadri. So we'll see what happens if, if uh, my fellow GM bites on that. Um, but same thing with Brock Besser. There's a little bit more risk with Besser because he does have that injury history. Things are pretty toxic, of course, in Vancouver right now. Uh, but again, you look at Bester's stats, the shooting percentage is crazy low. That's the first place to look. We know that the goal total should come back up. And to me, if anything, if you have them both, I would hold them. If you don't have them, I would be targeting them in trades, especially Shifley. But I'd say Brock Bester too for a buy low. All right. Next question is Stu Gardner, who's one guy you always draft each year that isn't a star. I, t- I texted you and said mine was Ray Whitney. Ray Whitney. Back when nice. he was just like every year you could always count. You even to a point Matt Cullen, but not for a point perspective. It was just like another stats. For sure. Uh, it's weird. Going into this year, it was Vander Kane for me because he gave you such a buffet of stats, right? He gave you tons of shots, tons of hits, or if you, had a, if you were in a penalty minutes league, penalty minutes, he was always a good source of give or take 25 goals. So obviously his off-ice problems have kept him away from the game, but if we're talking about someone that I always proactively drafted, who because almost it was almost like because of his off-ice reputation, it, it made him fall in drafts, and I found if you had a Vander Kane, he just contributed to pretty much every stat category. So I'm going to need to find my next Evander Kane, I guess, because he's no longer reliable. Maybe we see him back in the NHL later this year, but maybe not. Um, but that would be my answer in terms of all-time player that I've repeatedly gone back to the well and drafted. He might be a really good buy, 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 really, really low yeah. at this point. Because if he ends up playing, you never know. If you scoop him off the wire, you never know. Uh, David Hansen asks for the next five years, Fox or Makar? It's funny because I looked at that question and I thought, well, Kale McCarr is younger, but no, he's not. They're the same age. I forgot. They're actually both 23 years old. I still think you have to lean slightly toward McCarr. Uh, Fox has been incredible. He's got the Norris Trophy. He's producing this year better than a point per game. He's tremendous. He's going to be a great defenseman for years to come. He's great at both ends of the ice. If we're talking about a fantasy context, though, um, what, what Kale McCarr is doing hasn't been seen this century. I think the closest comparable would be Brian Leach in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, and he's the last NHL defenseman to score 100 points. And I think the next NHL defenseman to get 100 points, 
I think it's going to be Kale McCarr one of these years. He's got 64 points in his last 60 games, and he's still just getting started. Think about how late a lot of defensemen mature at the NHL level. He has, I think, a couple more rungs to go up on the ladder, uh, whereas Fox, I think, is getting closer to his peak. McCarr, I just think the potential is sky high. He also just is in a more fantasy-friendly situation. Rangers are still a good fantasy environment, but I think I don't think it's the same as the level Colorado is on, uh, especially now we know that Gabriel Landeskog is staying and most of their core is locked up. Uh, so McCarr is going to have great teammates to pass the puck to for years to come. Uh, so I do lean McCarr, but if you have Fox as a keeper, that's still tremendous. I would love to have both. It's funny, though, what's changed. Even a year ago, this question, who is it instead of Adam Fox people are asking about? Quinn Hughes. Quinn Hughes, right? So it shows how far Quinn Hughes has already fallen in the court, I don't want to say court of public opinion, but just the general perception, especially in the fantasy hockey community. So don't forget about him. If Vancouver sorts itself out, Quinn Hughes eventually will be back in that discussion too. I'm not worried about Quinn Hughes. It's just when you look at, like, obviously one of these guys just won the Norris Trophy, and, and the other, had he stayed healthy the whole year, probably would have been a really good uh, shot at it. But, uh, yeah, that's all the questions. It's the starting lineup today, which I will just say before you say what it is, uh, this is a very T- big discussion recently at a Leafs uh, media, uh, the media box, because apparently there's nothing better to do before a game. And uh, we were talking about the food options in Toronto. Like, what, what, what is Toronto known for food? And if you had to pick one thing, and nobody seemed to have an answer. Yeah, like, that, that is the answer, because I think Toronto is a tremendous place to eat, because it's known for having all of the foods. But same with New York, same with Montreal. Like, say, like that's not a, except Montreal. Yeah, it's true. New York and Montreal have. have you, you, yeah, you could unique. pick. You could pick yes, like yes. one or two things there, but you can't for Toronto. But those places yeah. are also very multicultural. Yeah, that's true. Good point. Good point. Um, so this question, yeah. So it, it's the starting lineup is is uh, the best Canada only foods. Foods you can only we think find in Canada. It was a listener that submitted this, but we can't find the original question. We know the topic, so whoever submitted it. Thank you. This is a really fun category. Hopefully I did my research right. I double checked my answers and I think these are, if they're not, maybe some of these things can be found in, in the U.S., but I think in small quantities and not the real thing. Okay. You forgot all dressed chips. No, I didn't. I didn't. And ketchup chips didn't make my list either. Okay, no. you're weird. I'm not you, a chip guy. Because number five, it should not be on this list. <laughs> well, I'm going to defend it, okay? So number one, donairs, right? So that is a delicious treat. It's sort of a street food and it's more associated with the Maritimes. This is like a shaved, I guess you call it a shaved beef. I don't know exactly how you describe it, but it's delicious. Um, number two, beaver tails. And I know beaver tails have been sort of commodified into a chain, but I'm talking OG beaver tails. I grew up in Ottawa when I was a little kid, getting pulled in the sled on the Rideau Canal, eating beaver tails. Delicious. It's like a flattened donut with a lot of sugar on it. Uh, number three, you got to say poutine. And I know people are snobby about poutine, but we can't overthink this one. It's still very tasty, if you, especially if you get, get it from a good place. Um, people will say Montreal. I'm still partial to it as a former student at Western. Sammy Suvlaki had great poutine in London. Uh, Number four is a weird one. So Smarties. I've heard this before and I looked into it more. Apparently Smarties in the U.S. are not the same as Smarties in Canada. So Canadian Smarties are just like, you know, the chocolate coated candy. I always think of them as the rival to M&M's. Apparently in the U.S. Smarties are like powdery candy. Like the equivalent of what we call rockets here, which blows my mind. If that's not true, someone write into me and tell me. But... If that is true, I feel very sorry for you, America, that those are what you call Smarties. That's, that's quite unfortunate. Number five, Stephen doesn't like this one, Nanaimo bars. I don't think Nanaimo bars get enough respect. Just no one likes them. <laughs> I, see, people say that, but what's there not to like? It's a tasty chocolate treat with a custard in the middle. It's it's like a, a brownie. It's like a wetter, a wetter brownie. It's delicious. I don't really seek out. Like I never go out and say, I want a Nanaimo bar today. But if I have one, if it's on a tray at a party or something, I'm like, ooh. Nanaimo bar. It's delicious. Okay, the last one. Again, I didn't realize this is a Canada-only snack. Joe Louis. It's very similar to the, the texture. It's like it's like a Twinkie or a King Dom, whatever, if you're getting that in the U.S. Uh, but it's tasty. It's a little pastry with chocolate and a cream filling. You can also get them in half, which is funny. I used to outsmart my parents because I was eating too many Joe Louis as a kid. They started giving me half Joe Louis in my lunch. So what would I do? Take another half Joe Louis, combine the two Joe Louis, beat the system. Okay, so that is the starting lineup. Canada only does, foods. Does female bacon count? I don't know. People call it Canadian bacon, but I, I feel like you can still get it in other places. You you can, but it's yeah. definitely a very Canadian. It's a popular Canadian. For thing. sure. Yeah, I thought about it, but I, I didn't make I didn't put it on the list because I still feel like you can get it other places, right? 
Um, and that concludes the starting lineup. Thank you, everybody, for listening and watching. We'll be back in a couple weeks. And again, send me questions if you have any tough roster decisions. Also, send me weird topics for the starting lineup because I want to be challenged here. It can be anything, anything that's appropriate, I'm willing to tackle. Okay? Thank you. I can feel myself.